Can we get a round of applause for our next presenter, Mr. Nick Hart? <laughs> Nick Hart, as young and dapper as he looks, is actually an extremely experienced dude. He has worked most notably lately with Snarky Puppy, amazing band who are going to be providing a track that we can actually break open and check out. Uh, the other big thank you for this presentation is to Audio-Technica. And Audio-Technica is sponsoring this particular panel because Nick is gonna go into mic techniques. The idea of this panel is the mix starts at the mics. Your mixing begins with the way that you record, right? So, big round of applause to Audio-Technica for helping us put this thing together and make it free to the public. One more round of applause. I'm going to stop blathering so we can get right down to the mix starts with the mics with Mr. Nick Hart. Thanks, Justin. We're going to go through uh, a snarky puppy track today um, and talk about the miking because it was a pretty intense session. Basic tracking ended up being 78 inputs. Um, and we'll sort of like get into why that and maybe listen to, listen to some of this stuff. But yeah, it was pretty, pretty crazy. So uh, the track I was going to look at is Grown Folks. And I wanted to start by uh, actually just playing the basic tracking session. Um, so there's no plugins, nothing like that. It's basically just what, what, what went to tape. Basically, every, we were set up for three drummers on every song. Um, but it was basically only two drummers at a time. Um, so two drummers, bass, two guitars, four guys on keys, a horn section. And, oh, a percussionist as well. Yeah, let's take a look at uh, the drum tracks, I guess, first. So this is, this is one, one drum kit, which consists of kick drum, three snare drums, four toms, pair, uh, three overheads, and, uh, and then one, one mic behind. You get the idea. But basically, because we had all of these people more or less in the same room, except for the horns, I wanted to keep everything pretty focused and uh, as tight as possible, with as little bleed as possible. So we used a lot of dynamic mics um, and small diaphragm condensers for, uh, for overheads, and basically goboed in between all the drum kits. So this is sort of view, view from the control room, and looking down at um, this is spot one of the drummers, and then to his right is another guy, and to his left would be another guy. And then percussion on the left, two guitars in the back. Their amps are off in the booths back there. And then on the right-hand side, you got basically piano, B3, Rhodes, Clav, four synths. Yeah, so it was pretty, pretty intense stuff. So basically, one, one of the important things I wanted to capture was the sound of the room as well. So basically, I had two, two sets of room mics up. So that's one. So this pair of 121s uh, probably uh, pushed pretty hard through a set of distressors. And uh, let me play the others for you. And so this is a pair of uh, C12s. Cool, so you can obviously hear there's lots of percussion in there too. So basically I had to tell them nobody could mess up or we'd have to do it again. On the kick drum probably would have been like beta 52 and there'll be an in and an out, so beta 52 and probably like a FET 47. Um, but again, because there were three drum kits, I probably didn't get to do that every time. Um, snares, I was using pretty much 57 on top and bottom. Same for hi-hat. Um, Toms, 421s, like the nor normal stuff. But again, I kept it dynamic, be knowing that it was gonna there'd be a lot of bleed, and I wanted to keep it out so that later on when we got to mixing, I had still had control over like how uh, how it was sounding. And the other thing was is I mean the reason there were so many microphones for each drum kit is because of the music. I didn't know what the music was gonna be, and with with jazz and jazz fusion, there's a lot of improvising going on. 
And so I wanted to make sure that if they did something different, I caught it, and it wasn't, it wasn't lost. So basically, yeah, then just the bass is pretty straight ahead. It's just a bass amp that was in an ISO booth in the back of the control room to send it there with a radial SGI. So we use those pretty much for every guitar, for the keys. Cool, and then so uh, on each guitar, there was a, a Warrior 121 and a 57. And th those guys were super easy. And the amps were right next to each other in the booth. Um, but again, with gobos and stuff in between. Cool. So on the on the basic tracking for this one, um, we had piano, and this was probably one of the most difficult things to deal with um, because it's an acoustic piano. It's in the same room as two drum kits and a percussionist. So there was like ton, tons and tons of bleed at first. Uh, Mic-wise, I had uh, a pair of KM54s and uh, a pair of Coles on there. But the trick with that one is basically goboed around the entire thing and built almost an, a house over the thing with rugs and carpets and kept the lid as closed as possible um, so that we weren't getting bleed. So that later on in the mix, if I want to affect it, EQ it, I'm not limited by drum bleed and stuff coming through. And so there's also Rhodes, which was running through an amp and a DI. And let's see. And then a Prophet, which is just straight DI, no miking. Um, here's the percussion. And so obviously there's a decent amount of bleed in that. So there were two, two overheads placed above. And then there were two close mics. And before each song, I'd try to go in there and figure out what he was going to do. I mean, they were sort of making this stuff up. But uh, I'd use these two mics to kind of spot whatever, if he was doing a shaker, if he's doing cowbell, just get as close as I can. They were 414s. And so depending on what he was playing, I'd either have it in hypercardioid, just to like stay super focused on that. Or if he's playing bells or something, have it in omni, but stuck right up against it. Um, again, this is to reduce it. So if I turn the overheads off, we should get a, a, a clearer, like less drum bleed. So this is like a lot, a lot less drums and stuff going on in there. So I knew if we had to, we'd be okay. And then we had the horns. Now the horns were scratched because basically there wasn't enough mics to go around or decent mics to go around. Um, and I wanted them isolated, so I wanted them in back in a booth. There's a little booth behind the control room. So the, uh, yeah, the bass amp was here, and the horns were in here, like four guys. So it wasn't that big of a room. Um, and then these two ISOs, this is where guitar amps were, and this is where the, uh, the Leslie for the B3, and then an amp for uh, Rhodes and Clav and stuff. That's pretty much the whole, the whole basic tracking thing. Um, so from, from there, we went on to doing overdubs. And this is sort of where it got sort of more fun, because that was pretty stressful to make sure everything got down. All right, so this is basically once we'd finished tracking um, and gone through you know, all the overdubs. So you have the original tracks in here. And obviously, we, lost, we, we, we didn't need to keep all of the stuff, because there were some tracks that didn't have anything on it. Um, the song is like eight minutes long. So I don't know if you guys want to like sit through the entire thing more than once. So obviously the horns, this is where we, we, we tracked horns. Um, so on this, I mean, I, I tend to take a lot of microphones 
Um, and on a lot of these overdubs, we'll do basically like if there are inputs, I'll find something to use them for. Um, one, because you can do things like distort them or run them through effects. And you can have it and you can track it like that, but you're not committed to it. So if somebody hates it later on, you don't have to worry about it. Um, so for the horn tracking part, um, basically I had them set up in a semicircle, each one of them with a Royer 121. Um, <clears throat> and then they're facing in towards an M50, which is an omnidirectional large diaphragm tube. And that I ran through a culture vulture. Do you guys know what that is? So it's a, it's a distortion box, basically, and just, I'll play it for you, basically distorted it, and then took the two uh, C12 room mics again. Uh, so you see they were sort of set up in the semicircle. There's a, lot, there's a lot of mics going on in there, but if you can see, so each with a 121, and then the, the, the C12 here, room mic, so like 10, 15 feet back, and I'll uh, play you what those guys sound like. So just Royal 121. And so even though they're standing right next to each other, you're not really hearing the other guys. And that's because the Royers are bi-directional. And so they're rejecting from the sides. So if you have somebody standing next to somebody, it's going to reject what's there. It's only going to pick up in front and behind. And so that's why I kind of had them in that semicircle a little bit and next to each other. So this is just the, the straight up Royers together. And then this is the this is the M50, which is through the culture vulture, which turned up a lot. Um, sounds totally messed up on its own, but when it's blended in with the other guys, it starts sounding okay. So it adds a bit of like fatness and and uh, a bit of size to it. Um, and and usually with with jazz and stuff, people uh, tend to be a little safe and do everything really cleanly. And, and not sort of take chances like that. And I wanted to sort of like push these guys a little bit to, to be a little bit more creative and open to some of this stuff. So things like this, we, you know, a few, few keyboard overdubs and stuff on here, which was Mellotron. Uh, this was done down in El Paso. And again, there was, a, there was a tape echo in the control room, like a full tone or something, or I can't remember which one, but... Uh, So again, because it was there, I took it. Um, sometimes with tape echo stuff, I'd mess with it um, a little bit, so it did all that pit pitch mod stuff. Um, and again, this is because uh, I knew that further down the road when we got to mixing, like I, I wanted things not to be super clean and to be a little bit, uh, a little bit messed up. Mm -hmm. oh, let me play the piano. Actually, we didn't, we didn't uh, take a look at that and just see what kind of bleed situation there was. So these, are, I think, are the uh, KM54s. So this had a decent amount of bleed. And that's, that's with a, a, a ton of goboing, and I, I mean, I buried the piano. In fact, let's see if there's a, a picture of that thing. This, this box here, that is the piano, just behind the Leslie. Yeah, I mean, that was, again, it was like super important just to keep, keep things separate and controlled. And this, this wall over here, the cinder block wall, uh, was put up because when we got in there and put the Leslie in there, it was so loud that it wasn't protecting the piano at all. So I went for a walk around the property, found a pile of cinder blocks, and then took uh, my intern and a few assistants, and we dragged them all into the studio and built a wall. Um, so clav overdub. So this is pretty straightforward, just amp, uh, DI. <laughs> And tape echo. Yeah, so that's just the amp and then the tape echo as well. And again, that's something I was doing in the control room. And with stuff like this, I would not send that to the headphones. Um, I would keep that to myself until like playback. Just obviously mess with people's time and stuff like that. So this will be the the mixed, the final mix session, minus one or two bits of outboard gear. Um, when I mix, I'm using the dangerous D box for summing. Um, I don't use it all the time, um, but for sessions like this where there's so many tracks, like I wanted to feel like there was a bit more uh, 
use more of the stuff that we've gotten, some more outputs, um, and hopefully sort of keep some kind of space going with that much stuff. So this I'll play, I'll play down the thing for you. Let's have a look at uh, what happened. Um, so basically, uh, any mic that wasn't in use, um, obviously turned it off and got rid of it. Um, you know, there were times, like, because there was the second or third drum kit that wasn't in use, most of those did not get kept. On some songs, I'd steal mics off there and put it on either percussion or on one of these other drum kits. Um, if there was, like, a, a different part playing, like a, if uh, the drummer's playing a cross stick, want to like mic the side of the shell of that snare drum. Um, but so basically go back through these drum tracks and clean it up like where they're not playing, take it at like turn it off basically. Um, I prefer editing like this than gating because um, I find gates don't always open in time. There, there is a little bit going on here with the uh, fab, fab filter ones, um, but just on kick drum there and snare drum. This will be the, fir the first kit. So you can see uh, kick drum is, is like panned up the center. Um, with a lot of these songs, like the, the panning changes, but for a lot of them, um, there might be a drum kit on the left and one on the right, um, like almost entirely all the way. Um, this one, I just felt like kick drum f felt better in the center. Um, but then all the cymbals and the snares and stuff are panned hard left and right. Yeah, so I mean, you know, there's a little bit of like EQ and stuff happening. Um, I found these guys really useful, basically when there was a lot of bleed. Um, these are also like, SPL has a transient designer as well, um, does more or less the same one thing. Uh, this is uh, from Native Instruments. But yeah, when I need to like cut, cut down on the bleed, things like this are really useful. Of course, on the snare drum, I added a decapitator. Um, let's just see what that sounds like. So I mean, it, it's kind of ugly on its own, um, but in you know, in context of the track, it like it, it, it doesn't it doesn't sound that ugly, and it gives it like an intensity. Um, so you know, with stuff like this, like I wanted to do a lot of on on this stuff um, and make it not clean. You know, I don't know if, how many like Motown records you guys have listened to, but like one thing I always notice is how like distorted most stuff is, and it's awesome and it's great. I feel like sometimes with some of this gear, it's it's almost too clean. And with some of these mics, they're, they're, they're almost too good. Um, so uh, yeah, the decapitator helps. So this would be Spud's drum kit. Let me go back a little bit. So he actually had a, a, he actually had two drum kits set up where he was. This thing that he calls a cocktail kit, which is just basically like a weird kick drum mounted on a stand, but facing upwards. And then a little snare drum. Uh, so we just did kick, snare, and overhead for that. Okay, obviously, alto verb plate for uh, reverb on there. Um, I tend to use a lot of different ones. Um, I'll use the, the plates and stuff for, from UAD as well. Um, and I don't know if I have a good reason for why I pick one over another, because um, they all just kind of sound different. Um, 
So I'll just, it kind of depends on what mood I'm in, I guess. So, yeah, I mean, here, I, I guess uh, for this track, I decided to leave that second room out and just, just use the one of them. Cool, and so basically both drum kits um, are getting bussed down to one drum bus. And so let's have a look and see what's on there. Um, so the Slate digital, I mean Slate tape machine. Um, again, for me, like the more saturation, the better. All right, this, do you, get, you guys familiar with this thing? The Dangerous Backs EQ? Um, again, this is a UAD sort of mock-up of it. Um, Basically, I, I like this thing because it has uh, this, this low cut. It's just very steep, and you know, if there's any low rumble or anything, it's gonna it's gonna keep it out of the mix. Because sometimes that can really like affect a lot of the compressors and other stuff, even though you're not necessarily hearing it. So I, I find this actually a super useful thing, like on drums and bass. And then it's the API EQ. And this this stuff, I usually I'll set it up, and then I'll I'll be playing like get it up pretty quickly. And then just play around with it until, you know, when I start bringing in other things, like not not spend too much time with it. But when I start bringing in other things, like go back and revisit this stuff, and then just see see how like one click either direction sort of makes it fit better or worse uh, with everything else that's going on. So in the beginning of this tune, there was there was a lot of bass overdubs. You, you'll see this is a bit, like pretty edited as well. Um, that's not for timing, that's just for uh, basically low rumble off the, the strings and stuff. You know, I, I like cutting that stuff out because I feel like it makes it more rhythmic in the end. But uh, again, instead of gating, because gating you might lose some of it, and it's this way it's like more, more controlled. So the, uh, the bass solo at the end. So it, it was a piccolo bass to begin with, and we I think we might have even done this overdub uh, while we were mixing. You know, th this basically happened in the in the uh, you know in the mix. You guys familiar with this thing in Pro Tools? Talk box. So. so this is, this is your your bass sound. So stuff like that I will try, um, and yeah, I mean I basically did it and then played it for for them and for the bass player and to see if he'd like it and just to show him like that the dot option exists. Um, turns out he, he really liked it and we kept it. But uh, there's plenty of times that somebody would be like, "No, nah, that's terrible. Don't don't do things like that." <laughs> um, but I, I don't know. I just like to show people the option of it. Let's see. This is the roads. Cool. So obviously pretty affected. It's, uh, looks like it's just Echo Boy. But again, I used th these guys again, just to make it more stabby, and then so it actually hits the effect a little bit harder. And it ch changes the way that the, the delay sort of feels in, in the context of the track. <laughs> and then, oh, I guess, yeah, I missed this. Uh, some whatever section of the song this is. Rather than sending uh, the piano to a reverb through an aux, um, just made a new track, copied it down. So that with the roads. Pretty spacey. Uh, these are just keys that come in at the end. So basically, yeah, from the basic tracking and then the, the one Mellotron overdub. So it looks like I got rid of the tape echoes and all that stuff on there. Didn't, didn't need it with all the other stuff going on. So this is the this is the crazy sax thing. Cool. So basically, yeah, there's only there's only three channels left um, out of all the stuff we took. So I turned off the turned off the plate, turned off the tape, 
slap stuff that was going, and instead um, put Octaver on there. Um, be nice to like run out through, but uh, yeah, I didn't I didn't have one handy. Uh, more distortion, in case we were missing some, and then an amp simulator on the DI. So essentially like two amps. So basically, yeah, so I wanted to get like an amped signal in left and right um, so that it becomes a little bit wider. And then we bust them down together through a tape machine. And then room. So because I guess I didn't track rooms on that one. Um, but just to yeah, give it some life around it. <laughs> cool. So it's pretty, it's pretty intense. You know, in an instance like this, um, we obviously finished tracking together, and then I mixed the first round, and then sent it to them, and then I think for the like, second or second and third round, we got together and sat in the room together. Um, I've actually found that most people's um, feedback that they give when they listen at home is better to me than what it used to be when, when you'd get guys in a room that they didn't know. Um, I remember doing mix sessions, you know, and the whole band would be there, and you'd, you'd be starting out and like getting things together, and you know, somebody would be like, "Oh, well, the snare sounds kind of weird," and they'd sort of like start focusing on that stuff. Um, I find usually the feedback that I get when people have listened to their house or in their car or wherever they're used to, they'll they'll be like, "Oh, you know what? The bass is weird because it's not the right vibe for the song." Um, and yeah, I mean, for this stuff, you know, I look at this job as, you know, I'm, I'm here to facilitate the artist and, and help them achieve the sound that they want to hear. And even though I do all these like crazy effects and things like that, it's basically just to be like, this is an option. And if somebody comes back and they're like, oh, it's, I hate it, like, I'm like, all right, cool, like, turn it off. Um, but yeah, I like to like propose those options. But uh, we're dealing with the feedback thing. I mean, I mean, um, artist feedback. You know, it is it is kind of your job, and if they if they sort of want less bass, then uh, you turn it down. But then, I mean, a, a good way to get around that is to basically play it to the monitor of the systems and be like, um, also check with your mastering engineer. Um, I love I love sending stuff to the mastering guy um, after you've got some mixes and just get some feedback from them, just to be like, you know what, too much of this frequency, too much of that, because they're paying attention to details that that uh, you know I I, I would have missed. Um, so I, I like having that kind of feedback from them. Nick, gotta cut you off, yep. even though, he, is this man a fountain of knowledge or what? How awesome was Nick Hart? Thank you. Thanks. Nick. Thanks. 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 Thanks.